Let's get right to it. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting. Uh, you, this book is called The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African-American Culinary History in the Old South. Of course, we just had, I just had about 20 family members uh, in uh, in Virginia for Christmas holidays. And so I needed the, I needed them black people to leave because it was way, <laughs> it was way too much food being cooked. Yes. Because uh, my, uh, my dad was, um, 
uh, was a uh, was the uh, lead chef for my grandmother's catering business, and yeah. then my brother's an executive chef, and so they dude they were planning meals, and I mean literally. Uh, you talk about it was, I was plus nine pounds yes. over the Christmas. I mean, it was just too much. Fun. I was like, y'all got to leave. Y'all got to leave. And it's Virginia folks, which means it's gonna be no, 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 no. From, from, from the Texas, top. from Texas. Oh, that's even from worse. Texas. And then my, then of course, <laughs> my, my my maternal grandparents are from Louisiana, so oh, you man. had. Okay. So we had like how a many four, gumbos were there? Uh, there were two. So we had a we had a, yeah. we had a forty quart pot that we did Christmas Eve, and then we uh, did a 16-quart pop uh, on New Year's Eve. Can't, can't deal. So, uh, so it was just, it was just crazy. So, so let's talk about this here. Um, uh, many folks saw you in the Skip Gates uh, documentary. Uh, and so when did you begin this journey where you say, you know what, I, I, I want to document this. I want to put this thing in book form. Well, I was a young kid, and my father took me to Williamsburg, Virginia. And I saw my first historic cooking demonstration, but no black people. There were black people all over the place. At one point, <clears throat> at Living History Museums, it was all black folks doing the work. But it was done in such a way that you never thought they had skills or abilities or knowledge. Um, and by the time I came around, there was a program to talk about how enslaved people lived and worked, but there was also historic skills and foodways totally detached from us. So when I grew up, became more interested in living history, I started to cook in the fashion of our ancestors. I'm mm -hmm. not a reenactor. I don't reenact slavery. Got it. I'm an interpreter of slavery. I'm a 21st, per 21st century person who dresses in the manner, knows the skills, knows the work, mm -hmm. knows the materials. But my thing was, if black cooks were the best cooks for the first 250 years of American history, where did that go to? Where did we start? What made us the best cooks? Um, and so, going from plantation to plantation, <clears throat> from state to state, I was able to pick up um, interviews with elders and learn, go in the woods and go in the water and just learn from the ground up the cooking tradition that is the roots of soul food. I mean, it's sort of like if you're trying to have a conversation about um, the history of music. Right. You have to deal with black people. Right. And you, you can't deal with that unless you actually go to the Mississippi Delta, unless you unless you understand. You have to encounter. And, and even where that came from, the, right. uh, the role that uh, music played came from uh, different parts of Africa. Right. Uh, and so, to me, it's basic. It's kind, right. it's kind of basic that if you want to understand uh, how this thing evolved, then you've got to go to the foundation of it. And then the next level for me was DNA. Because now we live in a time where Alex Haley couldn't even have dreamed of, where we have access to our DNA relatives mm -hmm. from West Africa. And so for me, it was like, okay, grandma and them came from Sierra Leone, and grandpa and them came from Ghana, and so so came from Nigeria. What are they bringing to the pot? Mm -hmm. how, what did they pass down that I received in my own kitchen? Mm -hmm. And how does that work for every other black American, especially now that we're coming up on the 400th anniversary of our arrival in British North America? And, and when we, t we talk about, we, we talk about this idea of being uh, the, the, the best cooks, it, it's interesting, the moment you said that, you know, I thought about where we are now that when, if, if you ask that question, well, when you have these conversations, and so it's, oh, it's Master Chef, it's Bobby Flay, uh, it's Emerald. It's, it's Paula Dean. It's, it's Paula Dean, and you, and you go, and so you now all of a sudden, you go through this whole marketing of food as if black folks didn't Don't exist. Think. I mean, even, even when I, I was, it was some show I was watching, even when it's, oh, you know, who's the best grill master and who makes uh, the mm -hmm. best barbecue, uh, don't look like us. Right. I mean, it is as if we. It, 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 to me, it's sort of like having a conversation of music, and then you go, "Oh, it's the Beatles, it's Elvis." It's, you go, "Hold on, I, I, y'all missing a few people." It's all. It's all, the, the TV makes it look like it's all about the Bubbas and not the brothers, and that's we are the root of barbecue. We're the root of barbecue culture. Um, I get in trouble all the time for making these arguments because it's a different. It's an alternative key to an alternative history, but that alternative history is the real history. That is where we come from. Food impacted every single aspect of every part of the African American journey. From when you and my ancestors were chosen to be exiled through war, to when they arrived, to how long they lived when they got here, to what they passed down health-wise to their children, their grandchildren, their grandchildren's grandchildren. 
food impacted every part of our journey and still impacts every part of our identity today. Every part of our identity. Well, first, it's the one thing that if, if you have a get together, uh, it's amazing. You, you could have the greatest basement, the greatest party room. People are going to gravitate to the kitchen. That's right. I mean, our, I mean, the reality is our, I mean, again, as I said, all my family, they, they were, they were, they were planning the menus a month before, a month and two months out. And I'm like, cause we're on a, we're on a family group meeting. I'm going, what the hell y'all talking about? I'm like, y'all are here for two more months, dude. They were literally planning the menus out in advance. Cause the hearth is the heart, the heart of the household. You know, um, going to West Africa, you know, multiple times and going back in March, taking a group of black chefs who had never been to the continent to go learn traditions of Benin in Togo, to learn how the spirituality and the health aspect, the food the healing aspect, goes alongside with the traditional cooking methods. And every time you go into the, the kitchens in the villages, the first place to take you to is the hearth. Why? Because that is where the earth goddess is, where this, where the creator, earth goddess meet. That's where your ancestors are buried, beneath the kitchen. And so all these parts of the different, different parts of our ancestry, our story, all fit together. We're connected to food in a way that other people just aren't. And I just taste better, quite frankly. And was that a result of being forced to be creative? Not, not, not having everything at your disposal? Was, was, was it a matter of constant experimentation? Was it a matter of, I mean, what? All the above. We were already the kind of people who went, okay, I kind of like that over there. Let me borrow that. Let me make it my own. Um, let me blackify. Let me do this. Let me take this. Okay, I don't have much of this. What can I substitute with it? How can I make, still make it taste good? I think one of the biggest misconceptions is soul food is what was thrown down to us, and that's not the way it works. Soul food is really what happens after slavery, after emancipation, after reconstruction. But the roots of that cuisine are what happened when we, the enslaved, enslaved the palate of the enslaver to the point where he and she doesn't know where they begin and we end, and vice versa. In other words, we Africanize the palate of this country, especially the American South. White Texans eat okra. White Texans eat black IP. Right. The Klan had to go to a black restaurant in North Carolina to get their catering for their big Klux meeting. What does that tell you? You know, Robert E. Lee said that the savior of the Confederacy was the black IP. His favorite meal was fried chicken and cornbread made by his mammy. Come on now. They, they can't live without us. They can't exist without us. But it's another story, and this book is not about them. It's about how we were creative, how we loved each other through food, how we sustained our traditions and resisted slavery and maintained our African identity through food. So when I go to Nigeria and I say, oh yeah, we got okra, and they go, what? And I say, oh yeah, okra, hot pepper, fried chicken, barbecue, fried fish, cooked grilled fish, we got the whole, and they just, they just don't know what to do. But the thing that got me the best was, when I was cooking with some of the women in Ghana, um, I was tasting the food and I went like this. I put the spoon in the pot, put it in the back of my hand, licked it off. Everybody went wild. Because it, was, it wasn't the association with the food, it was the, the fact that they knew that somebody's mama was at Cape Coast Castle and she survived to teach her daughter, teach her daughter, teach her daughter, teach her, teach her children. So what you did, how to that do was that. passed down. That's right, and they knew that was the African way of how to taste the food. And everybody just, like, like, it was like drums and whistles and everybody went off because they knew that tradition had been, had been part of us this whole time. Yeah. So the, so the, so, so the folks you mentioned, so the idea of tasting something and put it in the, on the back of your hand. Yeah, if you sell your grandmother, do that, your mother, you still do it. That is as African as you get. Yeah, that among many other things we did. You know, that grease pot we had in the, in the kitchen, mm -hmm. the fried, the, the chicken grease, the fish grease, and the bacon grease, a whole, everything. Basil by the front door. Saw basil all over West Africa by the front door of the kitchen with a household for good luck and for seasoning the food. I mean, all these little things that my grandmother from Alabama, my grandmother from Virginia taught me, and my grandfather from South Carolina taught me. I saw them, and I keep seeing them. Um, and this is why it's so important for us to realize that also our cuisine is not a pathology. You know, we've, we've taught all our lives, black English is bad English. Black music is the source of violence. Black dance is too sexual. You're, you're this, everything in our culture is considered a pathology by right. outsiders, and then we absorb that respectability of politics. And we've had a lot of articles talking about soul food will kill you. Soul food is not junk food. Soul food is not fast food. Soul food, 
the real soul food, is food from the earth. It's plant-based with meat as celebration food, with the sweets and all the good stuff as signs we love each other. But those were foods that were only available at certain times, seasonally, and proportionate to the family. So, we, so okay, so first of all, define soul food. So what, what makes, what is soul food? What, what are the, what are the, the specific um, meals or specific uh, food groups? What would you call soul food? Hey, I would call soul food, I even say soul food embraces Creole food. <clears throat> because really, they're part of the same family. It's that cotton, tobacco, and sugar belt, you know, that was from the Chesapeake to Louisiana, from Texas to Florida, Missouri to Alabama. And it was shaped by enslaved people. Who were the cooks? Who were the chefs? Who were the caterers? Who were the best? You know, James Hemings, you know, the best chef in America was a black man who was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. And those DNA lines, he was his wife's half-brother. They were all connected. Mm -hmm. But he, he few, infused European food with African ingredients to create a gourmet southern cuisine that everybody envied. And it wasn't just him. Um, these professional cooks were sent to Europe, but the main thing was they were still drawing an African background. So over time, we had foods that were based on our gardens, foods that were based on fishing, foods based on gathering. We've lost a lot of that because we had to move for the sake of our lives in the Great Migration. People forget that. We were forced out mm -hmm. of our secondary home because we had to make money, because we had to not get lynched, because we had to survive. And um, we lost a lot of our indigenous foods that were part of the soul food tradition. So now people think that soul food is just a meat and three. The candy yams, fried okra, greens with a lot of pork in them. Nothing can be further from the Mac truth. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Those are all really well and good celebration foods, fried chicken, but they're not the standard canon. The standard canon is actually beans and cornbread, sauté greens, fresh, whatever fresh soup or stew you can get from the various parts of your garden. And yeah, there was pork in that pot, and there was, but if you're working a 16-hour day, I've picked cotton 16 hours. I do that every single year to remind me why I'm grateful for where I live now and who I am now. But that work requires calories. But well, it, but that's it's just like uh, I was uh, reading a, it was a story several years ago. Yeah. And they were talking about the evolution of breakfast. Right. And they said what folks didn't understand was uh, we live we we were an industrial nation. Right. And so uh, <clears throat> the, these men, uh, they were largely men, uh, would eat these massive breakfasts because they were going to work in plants. He right. said. And then they wouldn't have their next meal until it was lunchtime, and that was 45 minutes or whatever. He said, so and they said that's where these big breakfasts come from. So, yes, yeah, so when they had pancakes or biscuits uh, and grits and eggs and sausage or bacon and, and all of that, it's like, and there's a reason yeah, for that. Because you were leaving home and you were burning off a hell of a lot of calories. It wasn't just they were not eating huge breakfasts. And they're coming to sit in office. Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. But you know, for us, our story is that hypertension begins both with the stress of racism and enslavement, but also the fact that those Africans who made it alive across the, the ocean during the Middle Passage and being seasoned in the castles were the ones who could retain the most sodium. So the very things that cause us you know, chronic health issues are the result of the adjustment to a system we were not used to. I mean, diabetes, certain cancers, are because we were biologically clustered. I mean, we were, every African was handpicked to be an enslaved person. And that's the scary thing. We're the, we're the largest group of genetically modified humans on Earth. Because somebody had to pick every single one of us who became our ancestors, right? But the chronic illness factor comes from the fact that we didn't have gluten for 70,000 years, and all of a sudden, somebody goes, here's a biscuit, here's pizza, here's a, here's, here's a sandwich. Those foods are very convenient and easy, but we're the lowest gluten tolerance, we're the lowest gluten tolerance of any human population on Earth, the Sub-Saharan Africans. So we have a lot to think about in terms of how we restructure our diet, our lives, and no reason why you can't enjoy those foods. But for me personally, it's like switching out the, the Kool-Aid for the hibiscus. You know, the cola for the unsweet tea. You know, the fried chicken becomes, it's special because I make it great, 
But the problem is it smells like your house for three weeks. People eat it in two seconds. And it's a delicacy. But why would you want to make that every week? So I kind of emphasize that, but also the fact that no one has to tell black people about plant-based food, healthy food. That's part of our heritage. And that's why we're taking black chefs, the second wing of this product, is taking black chefs back to the continent to say, okay, this is your heritage you never learned about in culinary school because they never taught you. They never thought it was relevant. But this is the root of Brazilian cooking, Haitian cooking, Jamaican cooking, American cooking, other parts of Latin America and the Caribbean. But, but that also goes back to again, this notion of white is right, the mm. white standard. Because because earlier when you talked about um, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's cook, uh, how he fused um, what he was, what, what, what came from Europe with, with what, what he knew from Africa. It's the same thing. If you had this conversation, it's, oh no, uh, the French, Hmm. Are the best chefs, and it's it's ooh French cuisine, right? And then if you want to talk about art, it's oh no, we we've got to go see the artwork of these great artists uh, from France. If you if you if you uh, uh, if you ask the question in terms of first of all, you you begin to uh, delve into uh, why is it that very few black artists hmm. uh, or you uh, are virtu virtually no black artists have paintings that sell for 30 and 40 and 50 million dollars because oh no it's 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 Rembrandt it's Picasso it's uh, Picasso mm -hmm. it's all and so <clears throat> when you begin to identify all these things that are great not us but then but then when you do visit African nations and you see these art pieces and you see these sculptures you're like oh my god that blows away anything. There would be no Picasso without that, there'd be no modern art without them. And there wouldn't be a vernacular cuisine of the Americas without us. Um, I remember going to the Southern Foodways Alliance and having to explain to a crowd of mostly white Southern food enthusiasts that corn had been with us as Africans for 200 years before there was an American South. So we had 200 years to play with this plant to think about how we were going to incorporate it into our diets, to sort of really get used to it. And it was no wonder when we came to America, we made corn sing, cornbread, cornmeal on the catfish, you know, corn pudding. You can keep going. Even though it was a Native American crop, we were master, masters at uh, being amateur botanists and, and zoologists. We just kind of looked, figured things out. We came to this country, looked around and said, how are we going to make these, these plants? Look, that plant looks like familiar. It looks familiar like what somebody had back home. That persimmon looks like the ebony fruit from back home. How are we going to make that work? How are we going to use it to heal ourselves? How are we going to use that to endure our exile, give something to our grandchildren? That was the thinking of our ancestors. And for me, for a lot of people, there's this internalized shame about enslavement. I'm proud of the picture in my book. I'm proud of it because this was taken outside the kitchen at Somerset Place Plantation, North Carolina. Dorothy Sproul Redford spent years researching her family history. Um, and why do you want to look like a slave? I said, no, I don't want to look like a slave. I don't look like a slave. I'm, an, I'm dressing like an enslaved person. And I'm dressing like the greatest generation in American history, the survivors of American chattel slavery, with whom we would not be here and with whom there would not be in America. So how do you, when you talk about taking those shifts back and Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you, or how are you getting them to understand that, for lack of a better phrase, the white standard is not the standard? Hmm. Because, what, because what I mean by that, what, what, my brother's executive chef, uh, and you know, he's had to, all these certifications and whatever. Right. That's a white standard. Oh, no, no, no. This, this, <coughs> you have to have these things in order to be deemed Right. Uh, an esteemed chef. As if all these things that you're, you've had to research, as if these things are really relevant. That's, that's not, because right. I think we know some great chefs. Right. Who have absolutely no credentials. Right. Who don't have any paperwork, there's nothing on the wall, uh, they, they, they don't need to wear Leah a Chase. jacket with their name on it. I mean, they are, they, they don't need anybody else uh, to uh, validate right. their greatness. 
-hmm. But see, the thing is, we we now we recognize this. The problem is, is at the same time the civil rights came in, we told our children, don't cook. Don't cook for Miss Charlie and Miss Ann no more. Mm, Wait a minute. Mm. At the same time, white chefs turned cooking into a, oh, that's that old black man and a little black woman cooking in the back of the kitchen into, I'm young, I'm white, I'm professional, I have a degree. And you need a degree, you need to be like us. You need money, you gotta go to school, gotta go to CIA, gotta go to these other institutions. And that left a lot of us out. So between us going, we don't want that anymore. So we should, what, is so it was just two ways. It was a two. It was a two. It was a, it was a two way um, street. And then those of us who were left said, I, "I'm going to do sushi." And then somebody would say, "No, you're going to do soul food." But no, but I'm really good at sushi and French cuisine. No, but you're black. You got to do this. You got to do Korean right. food. And then others went, "Why do I have to do that when I want to do my own cuisine?" No, you should really do French cuisine because that's the only way to prove yourself. See, it's, it's interesting as you say that because what, what immediately j j j jumped into me as you were talking. Mm -hmm. Um, when, I re when I read The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860-1935 uh, to 1935 by James D. Anderson, how that was this massive fight uh, with the creation of Hampton University. Right. Because the free slaves said, yo, we don't want our kids uh, uh, planting stuff. They wanted, they wanted their children to be doctors and lawyers and Teachers, engineers. Yep. And so that was this huge battle. And then, but you had uh, Armstrong, who was basically wanted black folks just to keep being focused on agriculture because white folks need it. His greatest student, Booker T. Washington, goes right. to Tuskegee. And so he's <clears throat> uh, talking about that in, in Anderson's book. He lays out how these students at, at Tuskegee were essentially illiterate. They, they could build stuff, they could farm the land, but couldn't necessarily read and do math. And that was this battle. That was this battle for 30 years at Hampton because they, they fought, don't want our kids right. uh, just doing agriculture. So then when you, when you made that particular point, oh, no, no, we don't want y'all cooking. So then you had black folks who, because this was all we could do, no, we want our kids to do, be doctors and lawyers and engineers. No, 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 we don't want you doing all of that. And so it is as if we, in both instances, we were coming out of oppression right. and did not want the next generation right. to do the very things that we did to get through. And as opposed to, it should have been, wait a minute, we can do both. Right. And then when it got passed over to other folks, they turned it into this art. And that's why they get to be on TV and do all this stuff. and. That's how I came out in the scene, talking about appropriators, talking about Paula Dean, talking about the fact that, you know, we're talking about Paula Dean and the N-word, we're really should be talking about why are, why are you letting Paula Dean say my grandma invented a hoe cake and get away with it on TV? While you're, why, why are you have shows on while she goes to her granddaddy's plantation with hundreds of enslaved people? Come on now. You know, what, what's, the pro what, what, what's the problem here? Why are we not able to engage with our history? But not only that, but, you know, understanding that it ain't about here. It's about our 70,000-year journey as people in West Africa before we even get here. So for these chefs that are coming from the Caribbean, from, from America, we're like, we go with Roots to Glory um, tour company, and what we do is we craft these tours so that we can go make the palm oil, bring the fishing nets in, go to the farm, see how the cutting grass rat is eaten. I did not eat the cutting grass rat. I wasn't ready for all that. But the bottom line First of all, was, somebody watching, what is a cutting grass rat? Cutting grass rat is a huge um, bush rodent that is very popular in West Africa. It looks like a possum and a beaver did something they shouldn't have. And it is the most, it, people love it. They just love it. And it's tender okay, and it's okay, crazy. What you say, they love it, they eat it. Oh, they eat it up. Their whole restaurant, the only thing, the only thing to do was this, this huge cutting grass bush rat. And you said, uh, I'm going to draw the line. I'm going to draw the line. Smell good. I ain't going to lie. That sauce Miss Mabel put together was, was banging. But you just said, I, I I'm going to draw the line of eating rat. I have to draw the line of eating this rat. <laughs> but it's that just the ingenuity. So we didn't come here and learn to eat a possum. We already knew. Okay, cool. It looks like something from back home. Let's, let's do it. Oh, so, okay, okay, hold on. So, so Shannon Sharp and I were talking about this. And Shannon Sharp grew up in South Carolina. Okay. And, oh, Shannon would talk about eating possum Rabbit. and all this, eating all this sort of stuff. He's like, man, look, I grew up in the country. So what you're, so what you're saying is 
we will say, oh, my God, what are you doing as country? But no. That's our heritage. It was folks took what was happening in African nations, and to your point, oh, that looks like this substitute. Right. Switch it out. So for these chefs to see that and go, oh, my God, my grandfather did that. Or we're from, say, say over oh, the West Indies, we do, we, we do that the same way. Or we're from wherever. Put the pieces together. They want to know who they come, where they come from. I have one chef who is coming to Benin who's worked with Native American chefs, like my friend Sean Sherman, who wants Native American communities to become better and healthier by eating indigenous food. We've worked with him for several years now. He's like, well, I got to come back to my home thing. I want to know, I want to know how we do this on a level with African culture and African American culture. So, so with this, and again, I, I, made that point, I made that point earlier <clears throat> mm-hmm. about white validation. Yes. With this, are, are you are you essentially trying to get this next generation of black chefs uh, to come to the point of saying, st- stop being so focused on what they yes. what what they say you need in order to ascend to be a great chef. Focus on what we have always created. And then what comes out of that is a whole new culinary standard. Absolutely. I'm sorry. A new culinary standard that is actually old. Yes. You know, when I was in Senegal, we were sitting down to have okra soup, okra stew with um, people in the hotel, the chefs at the hotel. And they were really hospitable. It was a big part of Senegalese culture. And my new cousin, Fantas, he said to me, you know, Michael, um, you are... Uh, we are your new family, but we're your old family. And you're always welcome at our table. And that's, that's the kind of thing that I want to engender in us. I mean, this book was not only hard work, but it became the first book by a black American to win Book of the Year, the James Beard Awards. You know, I was told when I started this project and started to market it to different publishers, America's not ready for you. You're not the American story. Literally, I mean, I'm quoting them. Your voice shouldn't be the lead voice talking about the South. What about so-and-so and so-and-so? And they were all white authors. So people resisted the idea of us taking our DNA, our family history, our food history, melding them together and saying, no, 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 these are my credentials. Some right. clubs you can join in, others you got to be born in. And that's what I say. And I say that is, is until you go through this process, you can't tell me who I am. Now I know who I am. I know the names, the clans people came from in, in the continent, what ethnic groups they were. I've been to the villages. I've had that moment of, of going from the, the castle on the coast of Ghana to the port in Yorktown where they arrived. And from now on, I want other black chefs of multiple generations to look at their food and go, you know what, we own this. We got this. And if we want to play with French cuisine and Japanese cuisine, great. If we want to meld them together, great. We know we want to end these diaspora wars and do Caribbean meets West African meets um, Brazilian, fantastic. Because that is our collective family heritage as black people in the Atlantic world. And at the end of the day, and just using your example about the big rat, <laughs> it was it cutting grass rat? Cutting grass. Cutting right. grass rat. At the end of the day, even though you didn't eat it, at the end of the day, you said, oh, my God, that smelled great. Right. I ain't eating it. It smelled great. The, at the end of the day with food, mm-hmm. how's it taste? I mean, you can, you can say, look, I, I, I have one of my aunts, one of my mom's aunts, I, my, grandma, my, my mom actually baked cakes for 30 years. Wow. She, uh, and so she did wedding cakes, every kind of cake possible. The reason I don't like icing today because I had to taste all, taste all that icing when I was a kid. She's like, okay, taste it. Ah, right, damn, too bitter, too sweet, too. <laughs> but I had one on. <clears throat> her, her case fell apart. You literally had, you couldn't cut a case. You had to get a damn spoon. Okay. It don't ma- It didn't look good. Right. It fell apart, but damn sure it tasted good. At the end of the day, food is a, how does it taste? Right. That, you can have all the greens you want to, right. but if it don't taste good. That's right. In the conversation. Well, that's the answer to the appropriation conversation right there. Is that, you know, yeah, you can make hot chicken. You're not going to make it well. You're not going to make it as good as. Right. So you so. can call it that. You can call it that, but it's not, <laughs> it's not the same thing. Um, nice try. 
and it's because we need the source code. You know, like I tell people um, on Twitter and coach, at Coach Soul, you need the source code. Black folks, we need to maintain and upkeep our source code because without the source code, nobody has anything else. Which is which is why it, it's I think for people who don't people who don't cook, um, people go, but 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 but, but uh, what did you put in it? It's like it's yeah. like, it's like the, the, my mom makes this <laughs> this pineapple cream cheese uh, cake and and oh, and, and li li literally I mean literally it's not it's not an icing it's like the top of the cake the 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 frosting the icing literally is pineapple cream cheese wow and dude the, the cake is ridiculous and my brother's tried to make it he can't he's an executive chef it it, it it's some things that. People, so people are like, but what? But what do you? Do? It's something that you can't replicate. It, it, it's that special thing. It doesn't matter what culture or what background you come from. Here's the same rules. I give lectures on how to teach people how to like do family recipes. But at the end of the lecture, I remind them something. You are not your mom and daddy. You will never be them. You are only half. You're half and half, and not even really that. Your children. Are not your grand, not your parents or their grandparents, or great grandparents. They are little pieces of you. Their children are going to be little pieces of them. Same thing works with food. Yes, my grandmother was fantastic, and my mother was the best. But I do things a little differently. Like, okay, cool. My people will do something a little bit different after I'm gone. Just like DNA. Food and DNA are one and the same. Each generation changes up a little bit. We can't be afraid of the fact that, they, that life is dynamic. Spirit is dynamic, mm -hmm. it's not static. Just like food, it changes. So if the pineapple cream cheesecake doesn't say the same in three generations, that's cool as long as it's still there. And that's the point I try to make people. The well, plus, first, first of all, because the new generation didn't taste the old one, so they they, they ain't got nothing to compare it to. They don't know. They so, don't know. So you just keep your mouth shut, right? Uh, and and then, then it's all good, right? It's all good. So let me ask you a question. So when you were, uh, so I was going through. You talked about picking cotton for sixteen. Yeah, uh, with an iPod in my ear. Wow. You know why? Because this, this damn spiritual didn't work. They were too slow. So I turned on the folk, the folk music from Alan Lomax from the prisons in Texas and Louisiana. And you know what? I picked me some cotton. I learned, and I broke down. I had an emotional breakdown because I realized I'm here by myself alone in this huge field, endless, this blinding me with the, the light hitting the lid and the cotton. And I'm realizing something. I'm realizing this is why we created a music, a community, a religion around keeping each other awake and alive. This, it could, you couldn't do, you can't do that, you can't be, you can't do this by yourself. You need your people. And it, it, all of it hit me all at once. It's not, you know, one enslaved person couldn't do it. It took a whole community of people constantly striving to be free and resist slavery to exist. When you were making this rice, mm -hmm. uh, explain that process. What, because the photo says pounding Carolina gold rice. Yeah. A Middleton plantation, Charleston, South Carolina. And that is before I knew, before I knew that my mother, blessed memory, um, her direct maternal ancestor was Mende from Sierra Leone. And I knew that her furthest back grandmother was born in Charleston. So I didn't even realize that I was doing something that my family had been part of their life for several thousand years. Rice goes back in West Africa 3,500 years, indigenous. And these women were brought specifically during the middle of the 18th century to cultivate rice. So when I t talk to black folks about using their DNA and using their family history and kind of combining narratives, I go, where are you people from? They'll say, I'm from this state and this state. Okay, great. So who came from where? We work out the details. Then they get, did you get your DNA done? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Yoruba. Okay, great. There were only six ships that came to Virginia. Only some ships came to South Carolina. These some came from Louisiana. And, they, and I go, how many generations can you go back? Oh, this state. I say, okay, that was when a slave ship came in. And they go, what? I say, okay. It's like, you keep digging. You find something, let me know. Nine times out of ten, I'm right. Because for me, that exact moment, everybody else glorifies when their people came to Ellis Island. We didn't have no damn Ellis right. Island. My name ain't no damn Twitty. My name is Keta. My name is Njai, the Lion Clan. I take great pride in that. 
But that's because we have these scientific and cultural miracles going on that our ancestors never could have dreamed of. Mm -hmm. But when you when you pound that race, you learn a couple things. Number one, these women have the strongest arms and upper bodies from known to men. And then the second part is they would never break the race, which is hard to do. When you broke the race, you made an inferior product. So these women who were brought in from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Senegal, and Gambia were so valuable that they made that generation of South Carolina and Georgia planters the richest white men on earth. They were millionaires within two successful seasons of rice planting. All that came from black men moving the land and black women harvesting and growing and, and processing the rice. Without mm. that knowledge base of the 12 richest men in the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, 10 were South Carolina rice planters. The richest man was a Maryland tobacco planter. The second richest man was a New England ship captain who shipped enslaved people, including rum and molasses. Mm. So without us, no America, ever. Which is, which is why when we talk about um, the book, uh, The Other Half Never Told, the reality is um, there was no capitalism. <laughs> we actually created the very system that right. America uh, right. still thrives on today. Right. Because, because that, without the slave trade, without that driving the economics, without it driving not just the South but also the North, I mean, the, the 13 colonies had no economic system. Nope. We were it. <laughs> we were the cattlemen. We were the rice growers. We were the tobacco growers. We were all of that. We were also, um, I like to think of it this way. What if we had been given our emancipation right then in the revolution? Would that African know-how with our American, European, and Native American understandings, we could have been the greatest doctors. We could have healed so many diseases. You know, it's the point where white supremacy screws itself. Where you know you go, okay, well, the potential for us to be have done all these things was lost by keeping us down, you know. Well, well when I interviewed uh, the white supremacist racist uh, Richard Spencer, uh, when he goes, oh well, you know, he's his opposition to slavery. He says, he says, no, no, no. He says, white people are so smart, we would have figured all these things out. He said, okay. we, he said we would have figured out how to pick cotton. We would have figured out all these different things. He said, we would have, he said, we're so smart, we would have figured all these things out. Eli Whitney and, and, and stole I said, the idea from the general from the enslaved people. But you didn't. <laughs> but you didn't. I said, but you didn't. You searched the world for spices and didn't even use in your own food. Come on now. Come on now. Let's, let's, let's rethink this process. No, it's, you know, for us, for me, it's like, let's go beyond the survival aspect and go into, what of those things that your mother and grandmother and even your daddy did with me was, you know, every Southern black boy learns to barbecue from his daddy and granddaddy. What is that, what kind of emotions does that engender? I grew up hating soul food when I was a little kid because I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s when KFC was considered what? Women's liberation. Pizza Hut was the greatest thing in the world. McDonald's, McDonald's had playgrounds, right? So we were, we were, we, 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 didn't, we didn't like that food at home. It had the bones in it and the pieces of fat and all kinds of weird stuff. But then, you know, my grandparents, my mother took me in the kitchen and my dad took me out and had said, okay, let's go barbecue. I learned how to pick the greens and pick through them, learn the process and owning it. And our children, if they only had that process, could really soar with our food. I, I do have to ask you, what, yeah. <laughs> you just it jumped out. What is it about black men and grilling and barbecuing? It's, it's like it is a, it's, it, is it, it's like it's a rites of passage thing. Yep. Go to the continent. Cameroon, the first meal we had. Poulet brassé, barbecue chicken. Uh, poisson brassé, grilled fish. Ghana, every single corner has a barbecue man. Nigeria, every single corner has a suya man. Take the little bit of meat, put red pepper on it, throw it on a stick, put it on the grill, take big slabs of ribs, things like that, I'm, with the sauce piment, the hot sauce all over it. it. Every country I've been to so far, has a barbecue man on every single corner. <laughs> and it's like, and hot sauce. And it's like, okay, I can't get over this. I can't, it, I tell people all the time, going to the continent will make you understand how black you are, but didn't know it. Right. You know, but it'll also teach you 
some of the fundamental differences, but also some things we lost, you know? Because the cooking is not just cooking, right? <clears throat> you barbecue that animal, the process of slaughtering the animal is very, in most, not all places, but in most places, very deep and like meaningful thing. You know, a kid doesn't learn that that's just meat. A kid learns that's a living thing. Right. And that living thing has a spirit. And they should do this, thing, you know, do it a certain way. Or else, it's going to be bad. Bad energy, bad food, bad everything. So for me, it was like, every time I go, I pick up a little bit new part of the puzzle. And hopefully when we go to Benin, we're going to be, um, I should probably say this, um, we're doing a GoFundMe because we're bringing our first cinematographer with us. So we're able to document right. what the chefs see. And so you didn't do all the stuff? You, you haven't been shooting this? Uh, we haven't been shooting anything. So Are you now, serious? Yes. Yes. We've been looking for black folks with cameras who were who have the talent who were going to be able to do this. Wow. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's the I point. That. I mean, surely I, kn I, I was like, oh, I know y'all got all kind of stuff. Because, I mean, this, we are I mean, just starting that process. We're just starting that process. We we at least just going to strap a GoPro to your head and then just wherever <laughs> you look is recording it. I mean, I, I, I that was because I was like, oh man, I know you got hours and hundreds of hours of stuff. Wow. The so when I talked about how do we how do we not turn this page, but how do we sort of go back to the future? Right. Um, somebody's watching right now. They. Look, they haven't been to these various countries. They haven't been to different continents. Um, but they may now realize, you know what? I should stop running away from mm -hmm. um, yeah. what is ours. So right. what, what are you telling where to start? How to start? Um, I'm going to tell you something <coughs> very special to me. Um, when I was a freshman at Howard University, I met a extremely important playwright and writer, August Wilson. Mm -hmm. August Wilson was really a really nice man. Um, he was very congenial. And I asked the first question of this thing, this big to do. And then later that night, I brought my little books together, my plays. I came to see him and line out the door. He pulled me, I said, you the young man asked me that question. And I said, I said, yes, sir. So he pulled me aside. We talked for like 10 minutes. I knew I was you know, taking up his time. <coughs> And August Wilson said to me, I said to him, sir, what do, I, what do I need to do to be a great writer? What do I need to do? He said, look me dead in the face. He says, I want you to go back to the South and find Africa for your grandmother. OK. OK. Big hug, sign my books, enjoy August Wilson. Never saw the man again in his life. He said, go back to the South and find Africa for your grandmother. We have to be rich to remember that our, our stories, our parents' stories, our grandparents' stories are the first to be rescued and our children to recognize that their life and their times are just as valuable. Mm -hmm. we, we forget that we forget our own narrative. Right. To start to record them. We need to, we need to sit down with our parents and go, mom and daddy, when, how did you meet? How, where did we come from? What do you know? Talk to anybody who, they don't have to be just grandparents, collateral relatives. Mm -hmm. Go through that process. At least get get there. <clears throat> go to the go to your family's home place. Don't just go there for a home going or a home coming. Go there and spend a week. Go to the cemetery. Go to the church. Go to the land. Find out where your people were enslaved or where they own land. Sit there and meditate. Get your DNA done. I'm not going to go into that whole wasp nest of should we or should we not. Now you know where I fit on this on this puzzle. Go to African Ancestry. Go to Black Owned Company. I'll tell mm -hmm. you where you're from. Okay? Do your other DNA. Do your autosomal DNA. Find out where all the different parts of your identity come from. I talk about being part European, being part Native American, etc. But start there. And then if you're ready, when, if and when you're ready, you can book that ticket. Mm -hmm. Go to the continent. See something. Bring family with you. And then bring something back. Bring back not just pride in where we come from, who we are, but remember that first moment when you get off the plane in Ghana when they say, welcome home, mm -hmm. what that feels like. 2008, July 2008, when I went to Accra, Ghana. Uh, so we landed, and I took, a, I took a picture real quick of my feet touching the yes, ground. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, the cats with machine guns were like, no photos. 
And I was like, damn, y'all and these guns. Right. I'm taking this photo. And it yeah. literally, it was the getting off the plane, stepping on a tarmac. I took a picture. It was a very intentional. Right. One, I, I took a photo of when we descended in my first, I took a picture literally as we broke through the clouds. So the, my yeah. first view of Africa. Yep. As we were descending across Ghana. But yeah, got off the plane. They, they were like, no photos. I was like, damn all of y'all. <laughs> it was like, click. It was like, and it was, it, I, was, I had some sandals and linen on, but it was like, that was it. I was like, I don't care. Y'all can have a machine gun see, all you want. See, now it's different because <clears throat> they know they get something out of it. So now it's like, well, oh yeah, go right, right in. Right yeah, right absolutely. Where's that dash at? You, um, I did, I was asked this question, <laughs> and this would be the last question. Yeah. Um, you probably had already answered this, but every author I interview, I ask them, what was your wow moment when you were writing this book and researching it? What was that, out of all the things, but that one, that, or the first time where you just went, wow. Okay, so I'll, I'll put it down to three. One was fine, I was related to Sarah Palin. That sucked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. That's a wow moment. Yeah, but it balanced stuff out with Samuel L. Jackson, so. Okay. If you're watching Samuel L. Jackson, um, what's in your wallet? Um, but other than that, it was for me realizing that, you know, when I went to Howard and learned Yoruba, and I went to Nigeria, and then I came back and found I had four Yoruba cousins. And the ancestors are talking to me through the Ifa board going, you know, we're really proud of you. You need to know that. And I just, I lost it because I didn't have, I didn't have my mother anymore to say that to me. Mm -hmm. And here they were talking to me and saying, yeah, you're back home. You have a name now. You got to come back. You got to do your thing. And just that feeling of intuitiveness, the fact that things that have been passed down. One of the most important narratives I have is of that my grandmother's father's family actually passed down the knowledge that his ancestor came from Ghana. And when my family did the African ancestry test, they found out, bam, 100% correct. And then we found the relatives. So. You know, being part of a black family that for 250 years said, we're Ashanti, we're from the Gold Coast, that's who we are. And then to be able to, to verify that, then go to Ghana and see my people. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest wild wow moment. The book is, folks, is called, the book is The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African-American Culinary History in the Old South. Uh, Michael W. Twitty, I appreciate it. Thanks yes, a bunch. Sir. Thank you very All much. Right. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. Roller Martin Unfiltered Dot com. You want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roller Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. <laughs>